Okay, so this is our third video for section 3.2. Um, <clears throat> I do want to kind of go back real quick, and I'm going to put another circle in here. And I want to touch on something that I didn't get a chance to touch on in the other video. Horrible line. There we go. Um, we talked about the three angles, 30, 45, and 60 degrees that are in that first quadrant there. What I didn't talk about was what happens if it actually is an angle that lies on one of the axes. These are what are called quadrant angles. Quadrant angles. And those are angles on one of the axes. And so we're talking about like this one right here where this would be zero degrees, right? It didn't go anywhere. <clears throat> you can still kind of use the idea of triangles here, although for the most part, we're really not going to think of it that way. Um, when you're at zero degrees, okay, it's zero radians or zero pi. We don't usually write it as zero pi, but technically that's what it is. Um, the radius is still one. So the, the distance here is still one. Technically, and I'm going to do this, but I'm going to um, kind of probably erase it. If I were to make a very, 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 very small angle here <clears throat> for purposes of being able to see it. The opposite side would still be here and the adjacent side would still be here. Um, the interesting thing here is that that does have an opposite side. It's a very small one and it would still be put over top of one when it comes to finding the sine value. If we make that really, really, really super small, it's gonna be a very, very small number. And as a matter of fact, once we make it all the way down to the X axis, so once this side right here gets all the way down to the X axis, well, the opposite side now basically has a length of zero. So you might think to yourself, well, wait a minute, that's not even a triangle. And you're right, it's not a triangle. But what you're thinking of in terms of doing this is it's still a technically a triangle, but it's not really a triangle. If you know what I'm trying to say here, I don't know, it's kind of confusing, but it would be a triangle where the opposite side would be a length of zero. And if the opposite side has a length of zero, then the adjacent side is the entire length of the radius, which is gonna be one. Not maybe the easiest way to figure this out, but it does help when it comes to figuring out the sine value. So the sine value of zero, and I'll use it as zero pi or zero um, for radians. The sine value for zero pi would be the opposite side, which has no length, divided by the hypotenuse. So zero divided by one is zero. The cosine of zero pi would be the adjacent side. Well, that would be the entire length of one divided by one, which of course is one, <coughs> excuse me. And then the tangent of zero pi would be if I were to take the zero and divide it by one, I would get zero. Or again, think of it as sine divided by cosine, which is zero over one. So now if we were to go in the direction up here, at the 90 degree angle, well again, you're not really going to think of this so much in terms of a triangle, but in this case, the opposite side would actually be the one that has the length of one and the adjacent side, because there's no horizontal movement, um, would be zero. The easiest way to do that is just to realize that sine and cosine are basically going to flip there. So the sine at pi halves, because that is what 90 degrees is, would be one. The cosine at pi halves would then be zero because there's no horizontal movement. 
and the tangent at pi halves, well, now you're going to get something that we don't not used to seeing. It's 1 divided by 0. 1 divided by 0 doesn't exist. So it is what is called undefined. UND standing for undefined. So the tangent at pi halves actually doesn't exist. It is undefined. Um, and then you could keep going around the circle. If you go backwards over here onto this side, well, now the sine, because it's going to the left, is going to still be zero, but the cosine in this case would actually be negative one. If you think about it, it's because it's negative one in the x direction that way. It's just going to be easier probably for you to memorize some of this stuff in the beginning, and then we'll try and give it more meaning as we get a little bit further along. And then down here, the last one, your sine value would be negative one since it's going in the negative direction and your cosine value would be back to zero because again, there is no horizontal movement there. So those are what are called the quadrant angles and you're gonna need to know those values because it will help when it comes to um, evaluating your sine, cosine, and tangent and all that kind of stuff. All right, so now we're gonna talk about um, co-terminal angles. So co-terminal angles are going to be angles which basically finish in the same place. So let's say that I have an angle right here. Remember that an angle is made with the positive x-axis and its terminal side. So this right here would be our angle theta. But we can have a coterminal angle to that if I have another angle that ends in exactly the same place. And there's multiple ways you could do this. I could start at the positive x-axis and go backwards, go in a clockwise rotation, and that would give me a coterminal angle. The angle itself would be different because the one in green is positive, the one in red is negative. So they are different angles However, they lie in exactly the same terminal spot. And then you could also, and this is probably going to what's, be what's going to make this the easiest to figure out, you could also start at the um, standard side of the positive x-axis, and I could go all the way around the x-axis, one, excuse me, one ro full rotation, and then back to here again, and that's going to be another coterminal angle. And if you think about what we just did there, in order to figure that one out, we really just added one full circle to that, to that normal terminal angle. So the easiest way to figure this out is going to be to realize that if you're looking for coterminal angles, you're just going to add or subtract 360 degrees. Or if you're in radians, you're going to add or subtract 2 pi to figure out what your coterminal angle would be. So let's do an example. And I think this will probably make sense. <clears throat> Let's say that we want to find a coterminal angle to, to find the sine of 390 degrees. Okay, so the sine of 390 degrees, that is clearly something which is bigger than one full circle because one full, full circle is 360 degrees. So if you were to kind of think of this and sketch it, I would say, okay, I'm going to go a full 360 degrees, but then I've got to go a little bit more. And the difference between 390 and 360 is another 30 degrees. So I would go about up to here or so. And that, oops, that would be the location of your coterminal angle. So what you would think about here is that the coterminal angle to this, without having to worry about 300. Um, 90 degrees is just going to be that 30 degree angle. They lie in the same place. So the sine of 390 is actually going to give you the exact same thing that the sine of 30 degrees would be because that would lie in exactly the same spot and they would give you the same ordered pair out there um, if you were doing this along the outside of a circle but ultimately it's going to give you the same thing. So if you happen to know what the sine of 30 degrees is you know what the sine of 390 degrees is. They are the same value. And in this case, that is one half. Again, it's one of those that you're just gonna need to know. 
It's way easier than developing the whole thing. So again, how is the easiest way to do this? <clears throat> well, these are what are called reference angles, by the way. Um, well, the one I just did there anyway is called a reference angle, which we're going to um, get a little bit more into um, towards the end of this section, at the end of this video. So let's do example B, where we want to find the value of cosine of 420 degrees. Again, that is way more than one full circle. So let's do this, and we'll create something which is within one full circle by subtracting 360 degrees from 420, and it's going to lie in exactly the same place. I'm not going to sketch this one out. But if you subtract 360 from 420, you would get that that's the same value as the cosine of 60 degrees. And as long as you know all those first quadrant um, angles and stuff, like I said, we're going to need to, that is going to end up being um, one half as well. So it's going to be a good idea to be able to find the coterminal angles to these things within one full circle. That's the goal. You're trying to get this down to one regular positive full circle. It's the easiest way to think about it. <clears throat> okay, so let's do some that are in radians. So let's say that I have the tangent of 9 pi over 4. So a full circle is 2 pi. But the denominator is 4, so if you think about the, how you would get 2 pi having a denominator of 4, 8 pi over 4 would be equivalent to 2 pi. So what you're going to do is you're going to subtract 8 pi over 4 from 9 pi fourths because we're subtracting one full circle. And so that's going to be equivalent to, you subtract 8 pi over 4 from, uh, from 9 pi over 4, you get pi over 4. And so the tangent of 9 pi fourths is the same thing as the tangent of pi fourths, and the tangent of pi fourths is 1. Okay, let's try, let's try one more. I just want to do one more example here. We're going to do this one. This will probably be the most difficult one of the ones that we've done so far. We're going to do the secant of negative 7 pi over 4. So now we're dealing with negative angles. Well, instead of subtracting to, uh, a combination of 2 pi, because all that's going to do is make it more negative, we want to add 2 pi. Basically, again, we're trying to get back to something in between 0 and 2 pi. So you're going to write this then as the secant of, <clears throat> well, let's see, again, in fourths, 2 pi would be 8 pi over 4. So negative 7 pi over 4 plus 8 pi over 4 gets us to positive 1 pi over 4. Exactly the same location, so it's the same value. Now, secant values are not something that I typically memorize, but what I know because of reciprocals is that the secant is the same thing as 1 over the cosine of pi force, and you are going to need to know the cosine of pi force. The cosine of pi fourths was the square root of 2 over 2. So we get 1 over the square root of 2 over 2. Now simplifying, because you have a number on top of a fraction, you'll bring the fraction up, flip it over, and multiply. Or 1 over a number reciprocates the denominator. So you get 2 over root 2. Rationalizing that, multiplying the top and the bottom by root 2, you would get 2 root 2 over 2. Those twos cancel out, so you end up with the square root of 2. So there's a bit of a thought process that goes into figuring something like that one out. Um, but that's probably still the easiest way to do a problem in that, in that manner. If you have to evaluate a secant, cosecant, or cotangent, think of it in terms of the reciprocals of sine, cosine, and tangent. I think that's probably the easiest way to do that. All right, it is going to be useful for us to know which quadrants on the xy plane that all the trig functions are positive and negative in. That's going to be a very useful thing. Um, there is typically an acronym that goes with this that makes it real easy to memorize. A, S, T, C. And it goes in a um, 
counterclockwise fashion, starting in the first quadrant. ASTC, a lot of people have, um, from my past, have said all students take calculus, which obviously I'm hoping that most of you will um, after taking this class. You can use whatever acronym you want to come up with, but ASTC is the order. And what this is saying is, in the first quadrant, all trig functions are positive. So sine, cosine, tangent, um, secant, cosecant, cotangent, everything is positive in the first quadrant, which really should make sense considering that all the X and Y values in the first quadrant are positive. So this would be your first quadrant. The second quadrant is the one to the upper left. Goes Again, it goes in a counterclockwise fashion. Well, the S stands for sine. And this is telling us that the sine is positive. So all of your sine values are going to be positive in the second quadrant. Well, if sine is positive in the second quadrant, that means its reciprocal is also going to be positive because reciprocal just means flip over the fraction. You're not changing any signs or anything. You're just flipping over the fraction. So the cosecant is also positive. So again, these are the ones we're focusing on, AS. So hopefully if you're um, thinking about this correctly, now in your third quadrant, the T obviously stands for tangent. And your tangent is going to be positive in the third quadrant. But of course, if tangent is positive, that means that the cotangent, because the reciprocal, will also be positive. And there's your T. And then the last one, of course, would be cosine. And then if cosine is positive, then the secant, the reciprocal of cosine, is also positive. And this is quadrant four. So every single one of the um, trig functions has two quadrants that they are positive in. And that means that there's two quadrants they are negative in. All of them are positive in the first quadrant. So as you can see, if sine is positive in the second quadrant, that means sine is negative in the third and fourth quadrant. And then that follows throughout the rest of them for tangent and cosine and the other ones as well. So that's, um, that's a very important thing to know. So ASTC, all students take calculus, or all sine, tangent, cosine. Again, it tells you the positive quadrants for all four, excuse me, all six of the um, trig functions. Um, so let's talk about reference angles. I mentioned it before. And a reference angle is, um, conceptually, it's, it's not that hard to figure out. All reference angles are going to be in between 0 and 90 degrees or between 0 and pi halves if you're talking about radians. Basically, it is the angle that is made closest to the x-axis, and it's always going to be a positive value. So if we were talking about an angle right here, whatever this angle is right there, well, that is its own reference angle because this is the closest possible thing. Oops, did not mean to erase that. Um, this is the closest possible thing to the x-axis. Um, if I were to take the angle right here, well, I'm not going to go that way because that is not the closest way to the x-axis. Instead, we're going to go this way. Whatever that angle is right here, the difference between, in this case, 180 degrees and the green is the reference angle. And that's going to be a number in between 0 and 90 degrees, or again, between 0 and pi halves if you're doing it in, um, in radians. So let's say that my angle happens to be down here. Well, again, I'm not going this way. That doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to go this way. That's not the closest to the x-axis. We are going to go this way. So you'll take whatever this um, piece is here and subtract 180 from it so that you get a positive number between 0 and 90. 
<clears throat> so the reference angle is always going to be an acute angle And it's going to be something that you will find, which is by taking whatever the angle is that you're given and finding the closest x axis and doing the subtraction. If you subtract the numbers backwards, you'll obviously get a negative number. It's always going to be a positive value. So just make sure you do the subtraction in the correct order. So, for example, if I want to find the reference angle to 150 degrees, the closest x-axis to 150 degrees is 180 degrees. So I'm simply going to take 180 and subtract 150, and the reference angle is 30 degrees. It is basically the first quadrant equivalency to the x-axis of whatever the angle is that you're given. If we were to take negative 45 degrees. So I'll actually sketch that one out. Like negative 45 degrees could be like right about there. Well, the closest x-axis is right there. It's where the zero or technically the 360 is, depending on which way you want to look at it. 360 is way further away from 45 than um, zero is. In any case, <clears throat> all we did was we went backwards 45 degrees. So the closest possible distance from that angle up to the zero is 45 degrees. So the reference angle there is 45 degrees. Okay, and that's it. That's all you're trying to do. Let's do some in radians. Nine pi over four. So if you think about it, again, we've already done this as far as trying to find a coterminal angle. Find a coterminal angle first that's within one circle. So 9 pi fourths would be the same thing if you subtract 8 pi fourths from it as pi over 4. Well, that's already in the first quadrant, so that is its reference angle. <clears throat> and then D, if we have negative 5 pi over 6. <clears throat> so this one you might want to sketch out real quick. Negative 5 pi over 6 is actually going to be an angle which comes all the way over to here. And it's right about there. Well, going the way I did is not the closest to the um, x-axis. This would be the closest distance to the x-axis right here, which is literally a difference of pi 6 units. Because if I went to negative 6 pi over 6, that would be the same thing as negative pi, which would get me all the way back around to the 180 mark. So in this case, pi 6 is going to be your reference angle. So again, you're looking for what the angle would look like if you took the shortest distance from that angle to the x-axis and placed it into the first quadrant. That's what you're looking for. All right, so we can use this concept to find a value of, like I said, a trig function relatively easily. So let's say that we want to find the cosine of 17 pi over 6. <clears throat> okay, that is definitely not something that is within one full circle, so it's not the easiest to figure out. But we can figure out what it's going to be because we know a couple things. We know how to find a reference angle now, and we know how to figure out what quadrant this thing is going to be in. So, 17 pi over 6, let's write it as the reference angle. So the reference angle for 17 pi over 6, well, let's see. First of all, that's not even within one full circle. So let's break it down into one full circle. In 6, 12 pi over 6 would be 2 pi. So let's subtract 12 pi over 6, and we would get 5 pi over 6. Okay, 5 pi over 6 is actually in the second quadrant. So again, a little sketch real quick of that. 5 pi over 6 would actually be over here. So again, the closest distance is not that one. The closest distance is going to be that one, which is pi over 6. So really what I'm going to ask myself is, what is the cosine of pi over 6? 
That is one that we need to know, and that's going to be the square root of 3 over 2. But since it's in the second quadrant, I have to ask myself, is cosine positive or negative in the second quadrant? And if you go to your ASTC, you'll know that sine is positive there, but cosine is not. So the cosine of 5 pi over 6 is going to be the negative square root of 3 over 2. And since 5 pi over 6 and 17 pi over 6 are coterminal, the cosine of 17 pi over 6 is the same thing. I know it's kind of a long way to get to that point, but this is one way that you can do it um, in order to figure out a value like that. <clears throat> All right, and then the last thing is that we're going to talk about in this video, because this is the longest of the three for sure, is once again, we want to find the exact values of trig functions. But now that we know some additional information, we're going to be able to do um, a little bit more with this. So our last example will be, let's say that they tell us that the cosine of theta is negative 2 over 3. Let's put that negative where it's supposed to come on, where it's supposed to go out in the front. And we also know that pi halves is less than theta, which is less than pi. So that's kind of giving us a domain for pi uh, for theta. So the important part about that second one is it tells us what quadrant we're in. If you're between pi halves and pi, pi halves is 90 degrees, pi is 180. So that means we're between 90 and 180. This means you're in quadrant two. Okay, and that tells us where what's going to be positive and negative. So that'll be good. Now. We're going to go back to the whole idea that we're going to be able to figure this thing out from a triangle. So here's my angle. And we know cosine is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent is the numerator. And the hypotenuse is the 3. So 2 over 3. We can then use the Pythagorean theorem. So 2 squared plus b squared is going to equal 3 squared. So b squared will equal 9 minus 4, which is 5. So b is going to equal the square root of 5. We don't have to worry about a plus or minus because it's a length of a side, so it's got to be positive. <clears throat> and now we can find the results of all the rest of them. So sine, I'm going to go ahead and just rewrite the cosine, even though it was given to us tangent. Again, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, which is why I line it up that way. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, and cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. All right, let's fill in the one that was given to us. Cosine is negative 2 over 3, which means that secant is the reciprocal. Flip it over. Negative 3 over 2. That one's done. That's the easy one. Sine, we can go from our, um, our triangle now. It's going to be opposite over hypotenuse. So square root of 5 over 3. Okay, cosecant, flip that over. 3 divided by the square root of 5. I'm not rationalizing in this case. I'm just going to leave it like that. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So that's going to be the square root of 5 over 2, and then cotangent, flip that over, 2 over the square root of 5. Now, the important part about knowing the quadrant 2 is it tells us what was positive and what's negative. In quadrant 2, sine is positive. So the square root of 5 over 3 for sine is perfectly fine. Cosecant is also going to be positive because it's the reciprocal. However, since sine is the one that's in positive in quadrant two, cosine should be negative, which it is, and tangent should be negative. So we need to make sure that cotangent and tangent actually have negative values. That's how you would find the other six values. So you're using the quadrant, so you know the positive and negative signs, and you're using the triangle idea. Um, there might be a time, and we're not going to walk through this whole thing, there might be examples where they give you a terminal point. Maybe they're going to tell you um, 
your terminal point is at the point three negative one. Well, that would be, you know, one, two, three, negative one. Your terminal point would be here, which means that if you were to draw a line from there, in order to get to that terminal point, you would have to go right three, whoops, right three, and then down one, three, negative one. Well, all that does is give you the size of a triangle. And then you could find the hypotenuse, then you could use the fact that this is theta to be able to figure out the remaining, um, the remaining all six trig functions technically. Because now you could get sine, cosine, and tangent. You would have that this right here would be the square root of 10, I believe it is. <clears throat> Using Pythagorean theorem. So now you could do sine, cosine, and tangent. So not a bad idea to sketch out um, if they give you a terminal point so you can see how your right triangle should be formed. But again, whatever your code, whatever your terminal point is, there's going to be an X and a Y value to get you there. That forms your right triangle. The terminal point will always be along the hypotenuse. All right. Very, very long lesson. I probably didn't even get to cover every possible thing, but I think this should be enough. And if there's any questions, please let me know.